When the camera guy goes like this, that means we're live, folks. Thanks for tuning in. One more week of Elk Talk Live. I can't believe, I think we're on like episode 31 or something like that. That's amazing. But anyhow, I want to thank you for being here. Tonight, we're going to talk about one topic. We're going to try to pick the questions that relate to this topic. The topic is how you can hunt elk every year. I don't care what state you live in, there is a place and a time, a season, where you can go and hunt elk every year. But before we get to that, we want to thank, well, first we want to tell you and remind you to share this with your friends. And you probably already know that if you text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 77453, you're going to get notified anytime we go live. But I want to thank Botech and Leupold, Ripcord, Tight Spot, Black Gold, uh, Onyx Maps. They're giving you the 20% promo code. Use Randy, R-A-N-D-Y. They'll give you 20% off their app products. Uh, GoHunt.com. Use promo code Randy, and they're going to give you $50 of free gear credit in their store. Uh, lots of cool stuff. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. So it's because of all them that all of this works the way it does, that we're able to bring it to you every Wednesday. You can see we got a slightly different studio here. We moved offices, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that, well, just maybe we won't run into the technical difficulty that we had last week. Those of you who tried to watch us on Facebook last week, it would connect to YouTube and live stream and everything else, but it wasn't, it was not connecting in any way, shape or form to the YouTube or the Facebook feed. So <clears throat> I got my cheat sheet right here. Whenever people ask me to do this lecture and I do this presentation a lot, the, the I break it out about if you're going to hunt elk every year, I have the one year plan or every year plan. Then I have the five year plan and then the once in a lifetime plan. And there are some states that you can go and hunt every year. So it kind of works like this, and it, it, it always is going to depend on what your budget is, both in terms of your budget of money and your budget of time. But whatever that pool is, we got to think about how can you allocate that money in the best manner. And some states require you to buy a license up front, non-refundable license. Some states don't. Do you want to sink that cost in a non-refundable license and maybe not even draw? So there's a whole bunch of things that go into this. But I'm going to tell you right now, the states you can hunt elk in every year are for sure Colorado and Idaho. Idaho has not sold out their non-resident elk tags for 10 years, 15 years maybe. Colorado doesn't have a limit on their second and third rifle tags and pretty much their archery tags. Yeah, there, there are units where it's limited entry draw. But a big portion of the state, I think it's 90 some units in Colorado, are over the counter. It means you can just go there and buy it over the counter, you can go online and buy it. So every year you could go and hunt Colorado and Idaho. And one of the beauties of hunting a place every year is that you get to learn it. My brother hunts this spot in Colorado he went out there twice and he got skunked. The next year he shot a cow, this year they shot a bull. He's learning that spot because he goes there every year. And you can do the same thing. Now, Montana used to be on my list of you can hunt it every year, but last year Montana did sell all their non-resident elk tags. There were some that were turned back in and so you can pick them up as refunded or return tags. So it's still your draw odds in Montana are really, really high, but not the 100% guarantee like they used to be. So then I look at, all right, while you're going and hunting those places, one of those places every year and you're learning it, you're picking up some skill, some, some knowledge about elk hunting, if your budget allows, maybe start building points in one of these other states and you might get a chance to go on a really good elk hunt every four, five, or six years. And that's why I call it a five-year plan. If you build points in Arizona, you build points in Wyoming, you're probably going to go elk hunting there every four to six years, 
So long as you're not trying for some of the permits that are what I call glory tags. With four to six points in those two states, you have a really good hunt in front of you. I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's not gonna be like hunting them with a, ri a rifle in the rut kind of hunt, but these are still really good hunts. So every, I'd say four to six years, you can count on that. And even in Colorado, you're going and doing the over-the-counter hunt, but you can apply for one of the limited entry tags and be building points. In Colorado, once you get to five or six points, there's really not much difference in the quality of the hunt you can get in with 10 points versus five or six points. So go every four or five or six years on one of the limited entry hunts in Colorado. So <clears throat> those are the states that uh, New Mexico could be another once every five year hunt, but New Mexico draw odds are getting less, uh, getting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. New Mexico is starting to become maybe one of those once every 10 year kind of places to go elk hunting. And then you have the states of Utah and Nevada, which I call those the once in a lifetime states. You have to build a lot of points. You might luck out and randomly your number will be picked and, and they have a bonus point system. So it's like having raffle tickets. The more tickets you have, the greater your chance of winning the raffle. Well, that's how it is in those two states. But the draw odds, even at that, are so, so slim. And the amount of opportunity that they give to non-residents is so slim. I really don't even think of that, those two states, in my hunt elk every year kind of strategy. So the states that I focus on for hunting elk every year, Idaho, Colorado, Montana. You can consistently count on that. And then I'd start adding to that list probably limited entry draws in Colorado, Wyoming for sure, and definitely Arizona. A lot of you say, well, how do you guys draw so many tags in Arizona? Well, if you watch the YouTube video that we did mm, three, four weeks ago, Marcus, was that? We talked about this elk hunt I went on in October, just two months ago, three months ago in Arizona. They have what are called limited opportunity hunts and I shot a nice bull. Limited opportunity hunts down at the bottom of the regs in Arizona. We as non-residents are not subject to the 10%, the normal 10% limit. Non-residents could draw every one of those tags in those limited opportunity hunts. There are decent elk in those hunts, or in those uh, units that, that, that host those hunts. So there's a lot of places where you can go there's no reason if you want to go elk hunting that you can't do it every year. I've done a YouTube video out on our channel that explains this in way more detail. Uh, one of the sponsors of our Elk Talk Live, GoHunt.com, when they asked me, they're like, Randy, our viewers are asking so many of these questions, or, or our members, will you write an article? So if you go to GoHunt.com, and I think you just search hunt elk every year or search Randy Newberg, this big article is going to come up and it's way more than what I covered here. It's pages and pages. But the point of this is you can go and you can hunt elk every year. And as your budget grows, expand the number of states you're building points in because you're going to get the chance to go sooner or later. So <clears throat> from a production standpoint, here's what we have here today. We got Marcus running the camera monitoring YouTube. We got Matthew over here monitoring about five or six Facebook pages and he's uh, feeding me <laughs> all we, we've somehow through the world of technology those questions are showing up on my screen here so how much cooler space do you need for a bull elk man this is so timely today I got a, an email from the good folks at Orion coolers you all know that I use Orion coolers they said they've been getting this same email and so we're going to be doing a YouTube video and I'm going to do an article about it. But the quick answer is that I, I usually bring 265 quart coolers and an 85 quart cooler. And if I want to have lots more ice, I could bring a, a fourth cooler. But usually if I bone it out and I take care of it, trim it up real good, I can take enough of that meat, lay it in the bottom of 265s, and you'll see if you go to our YouTube channel, 
Again, we have a video about how we keep meat cold and keep it from spoiling when we're out on the road. We use frozen milk jugs. So if this is your cooler like this, put the meat in the bottom, put the ice, the frozen milk jugs on top because cold air sinks. If you put the, the ice on the bottom and you put the meat on top, guess what? The, the very top parts of the meat are not getting the same temperature as the lower part. So usually with 265 quarts and an 85 quart, I can have a trimmed up bull elk that fits in there quite easily. You got to debone them to make it work. Uh, there's very few, <laughs> very few coolers where you're going to fit a boned in elk in a cooler. Um, and so that gives me a lot of extra space on the top for more ice. Now, if I was in a spot where, hey, I got a long drive home and it's going to be really warm, I might even split that into a fourth cooler and put a bunch more ice on top. And I'd end up with more ice in those coolers than I do meat just because I want to keep it cold. So what does the average cost, what would be the average cost to hunt elk in Colorado? Doesn't have to be exact. Um, if you count your license, and I'm assuming you're a non-resident, if you split travel costs and everything else with a whole, you know, say two, three other hunters, I did an article for elk, uh, the Elk Foundation, Bugle Magazine, how to hunt elk for $1,000. Well, that was six or seven years ago. Since then, the price of everything has gone up. I would say you could still do it if you split your travel costs and you were really cautious while you're on the road, you're not eating at fancy restaurants, you're splitting the driving time so you're not staying at hotels and everything. You could do it, three guys coming from back east could probably do it for 15 to 1800 bucks from home, hunting, and back. And that assumes you're gonna do your own game processing, all that stuff. But that's, you know, you think about it, that's a pretty reasonable price to go do a public land elk hunt. In fact, that's a really reasonable price. So, all right, Randy, do you apply to Arizona every year even though they require you to buy a non-resident hunting license to apply for an elk tag that you may not get? Yes, I do for a lot of reasons. One, you can't build points with, without buying the license. I also use that license to apply for deer, for bighorn sheep, and for antelope. And then I usually go down there, like Marcus and I are going to be down there in, what, a month, right? And we take advantage. We already bought the license. So they have over-the-counter archery deer. They have leftover archery javelina. We'll be hunting quail. Uh, last year I shot a duck while I was down there. I could have shot some more ducks. Uh, we've been down there dove hunting. So yeah, I do it because of all the western states, the, as far as opportunity and value that you can get out of your non-resident license, I don't know that there's a state better than Arizona. And with that license, then you build points. And those points are gonna be worth gold someday when you wanna go on one of these deer or elk or antelope hunts. So, uh, let's see. Can you give some advice for a hunter looking to start bu buying points in a range of states? Yep, I can. Apart from hunting Idaho and Colorado over the counter, how should a hunter with zero points look at the various states to begin building points? <clears throat> If you go out to GoHunt.com and find this article, you're going to see this spreadsheet that's there. But what it is, it talks about which state, what the license fee is, what the application fees are, what the tag fees are. But then there's another chart that will tell you which ones have points. And is it a bonus point or a preference point system? And part of that, to answer this question, it depends on what is your budget. If budget really isn't an issue, I say build points in every state possible. And don't just apply for elk in those states, apply for all species in those states. But if I was going to start building points in states, the two states I would pick is Arizona and Wyoming. Those are the two states where you're going to get the best bang for your buck as far as how quickly your points will allow you to probably get a hunt and what the quality of that hunt will be. Colorado, yeah, that's another, That's probably the next state where I'd start building points. Uh, the last state I'd probably build points in is Montana because it's a very, very expensive place to build points as a non-resident. And quite honestly, our general elk hunting in Montana 
is not that much different than some of these limited entry units, especially in the archery season. So Idaho, I probably, well, they don't have a point system. New Mexico doesn't have a point system. The lowest on my list for building points, the lowest on that list would be Utah. Uh, second lowest would be Nevada. The top two would be Arizona and Wyoming. So, um, Following up with that. Okay, Marcus has a follow-up question to that. With, with overlapping application periods, what happens if you draw two tags and can only go on one So the question is, with overlapping application periods, what happens if you draw two tags and you can only go on one hunt? I would go and crack a beer and say, yeah, I drew two tags and I'd figure out how to go. But uh, I, I get that as a problem. So let's think about the calendar. And that article out on Go Hunt that I wrote talks about the calendar, the draw deadlines. So next month, by January 31st, you have to have your Wyoming application in. And then about 10 days later, you have to have your Arizona application in. Well, pick one of those two states. And those states are going to let you know if you drew or didn't draw before the deadlines of most of the other states. So that's a little way to hedge your bet. Some states allow you to turn the tag back in if you, if you were to be so lucky as to draw multiple tags. Unfortunately, they usually make you give up the tag to get your points restored and the fee. So that, that could be a bit of a... I guess, expensive way to do it. But I would probably go with Arizona. Uh, if, if I had to, if, if I had this worry, I'd probably do Arizona because it's a bonus point system. You never know if you're going to get the lucky number or not. And then with Wyoming, you can buy points after the drawings are over for the upcoming year. So I would be buying those points in Wyoming because Wyoming is a preference point system. In other words, he with the most point draws the tags. So there's going to be some year you've built enough preference points in Wyoming, you know you're going hunting because you're at the top of the pile. Whereas in Arizona, it's a bonus point system. It's like raffle tickets. If you have 10 and I have two points, I still could draw before you do. So I would do Arizona first, find out about that. You'll find out sometime in March. Wyoming, well, if I was worried about it, I'd be buying points later in the season in Wyoming rather than actually applying. Uh, boy, it pains me to say that because I say apply everywhere. But uh, And then once I found out, then I would look at, all right, Colorado, Montana, Idaho, New Mexico, they're all up. Which one of these am I going to pick? And if I don't draw any of them, then I go to my fallback states of Colorado, in Idaho. That would be the strategy of how I do it if I, if I was worried. Uh, the reality is you're very unlikely to draw multiple elk tags. I've, I've done it one time. I drew Arizona and Nevada in the same year. Uh, and fortunately, I'm a CPA. I get all my work done by April 15th, so I, I could go do it from a time standpoint, but I understand not everybody uh, can do that. Uh, let's see. You hear that I'm going to be in Boise in April for the backcountry hunters and anglers rendezvous. Is that true? Yep. I'm going to be there. Marcus is going to be there. There's going to be a lot of people there. A lot of folks that we hang out with are going to be there. Randy, how often do you draw a New Mexico elk tag? Not very often. I drew la uh, 2016. I didn't draw last year. Um... I used to draw more, but the draw odds are just getting really, really, really tough in, a, in New Mexico. And part of that is I apply for really, really tough units. So that, part of that's my fault. Uh, all right, I'm going to get a new uh, rifle. What scope should I get? Boy, that depends uh, what rifle you're getting as far as what cartridge, what you're going to use it for. Uh, I would get, if budget's not an issue, I'd get a v Leupold VX6 HD. Uh, if your budget is maybe in that mid-range, I'd get a VX5 HD. Um, and if your budget is, you know, not quite that high, I'd get the VX3i. All three of those are unbelievable scopes. The, for the value and the quality. To me, value is the intersection of price and quality, right? There is no scope on the market 
in their price categories of the VX6, VX5, VX3 that is going to match the value you're going to get. They're that good of scopes. And when am I hunting Colorado again? Uh, well, maybe this year. I, I don't know. Uh, it always depends on the calendar. So I, I like to go and hunt the over-the-counter third season elk hunt, which is sometime in early November. Well, this last year, our, it didn't fit our calendar, so I didn't go do it in 17. You saw that in 2016, I went and I burnt my 19 points, and I, I did a hunt in, in western Colorado on that. But I I don't know. I, I, I'm dragging along a pretty good pile of deer points again now. I'm back up to three, which three deer points in Colorado can get you a pretty good hunt. So uh, if I'm going to hunt elk... Do, do I prefer archery or rifle? It doesn't really matter what I prefer. It really matters what you prefer. Um, if you're an archer, go do it archery. It's, I will say that archery hunting is way, way more fun. They're bugling, they're carrying on. And yeah, I mean, let's face it. This is not a 300 yard operation here. You know, this is, for me, this is a 40 yard weapon and it, it's going to reduce your likelihood of, of tagging something, but they're going to be bugling. It's way more engaging, way more fun. Uh, I, I, if I had to choose one or the other, I'd probably go with a bow. But if I like to eat elk too, so when I start getting hungry, I'd say, why didn't I go with my rifle? I need some elk meat. So <clears throat> what do you got there, Marcus? You got any? All right, what kind of sight do I have on my bullet right there? You see that? That's made by Black Gold. That's the Ascent. It's a five pin. Uh, all you got to do is loosen it, and you'll see it's a slider. So, but for me, I'm, uh, I'm not a long range kind of guy, so I'll even get rid of this bottom pin, and I'll have a four pin. I'll have a 20, 30, 40, 50 yard pins. Uh, but I've been using black gold sights since they started making them, and I can't even remember when uh, the first bow I bought had a black gold sight on it. Bomb proof. I, I don't know how many stupid bad things I've done to some of my uh, uh, <laughs> archery gear, but I've never had a problem with a black gold sight. So, Oh, gosh. There's a whole bunch of them here. Hey, Randy, I still can't find quality chopper mats. Where do you get them? I got a pair for Christmas. Why do people struggle to find these? There's a company in Duluth, Minnesota called Frost River. That's where this pair came from. I, I tried a new strategy. So the ones from Frost River ha already have a permanent liner. And so they're a size bigger. And... Then I can put the wool liner in this much bigger one. You're looking at me, Matthew. Did I make something up there? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, so I, for the really, really cold weather, I've got these chopper mitts. And then I've got the wool liner. I've got them a size bigger because they got a built-in liner. And then I'm using the rag wool liner. You can get them at, uh, let's see. I know in Wisconsin there's a company called Fox River you can get them from. Uh, L.L. Bean has them. So that's that's where I get them. What else we got, Marcus? Let's see. <clears throat> Someone asked, are you going to go duck hunting this year? Am I going to go duck hunting? Yep. I was supposed to go this week, but Congress changed the tax law last Monday before Christmas. And guess what I've been doing since Congress changed the tax law since Monday? I've been sitting in front of a computer screen trying to learn how to disinherit the federal treasury. So, uh, but that's all right. I got to work sometime. I got, I got to pay the bills sometime during the year. But, uh, so <clears throat> we're, uh, one of the things that people might be wondering if you've been watching our show this week on Sportsman's Channel, uh, we've talked about, we got some really big news. We, we took out a, our own commercial in our TV show to talk about a big announcement we're going to have on New Year's Day. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll hang around, you'll follow our, uh, 
our YouTube channel. You'll go out to our Hunt Talk forum, uh, Facebook, all that stuff, because we're going to start doing something in January that's a big, different direction from where we've been. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, happy about that. And all of our partners, all of the companies that bring this uh, Elk Talk Live to you, Bowtech, Leopold, Tight Spot, Ripcord, Black Gold, Go Hunt, Onyx, every one of them are supporting us as we go forward this uh, in these different directions. And I, I can't thank them enough. Uh, gosh, I'm so lucky. Hey Randy, in past videos, you have said that you shot your first four bull elk with a 270. Yep, I did. I had a 150 grain nozzler partition bullet in there. And now you hunt with a 7mm, a 308, or a 300 wind mag. Why the switch? Well, mostly I hunt with a 7mm 08 and a 308. And the reason I made that switch is because those are short action cartridges. You can save a lot of weight with a 308 by putting it on a smaller rifle and it's a short action you just go even up to a 30 odd six you need a longer action you go to a 300 wind mag you need a longer action and all of that is extra weight so my two go-to cartridges that you see us using the most is the 308 and the 7 mm 8 uh, and then you, as far as the 300 wind mag uh, i switched to that one year because i was going to alaska i went and bought a 300 wind mag and so now I use a 300 wind mag sometimes when we're elk hunting or Matthew shot his moose with one this year uh, with the 300 wind mag. Heavier bullets, yeah, in my 7mm08 I shoot 140 grain bullets whereas in my 270 I used to shoot 150s. In my 308 I shoot 165 to 180 grain bullets. In my 300 wind mag I shoot 180 grain bullets. So it just over time you kind of evolve your hunting style changes a little bit uh when i first started elk hunting i was the you know i i, I didn't have much money one rifle had to cover everything from coyotes to moose and the 270 worked for that in retrospect if i would have known more about cartridges i probably would have bought a 308 at that time rather than a 270 but 270 is a great cartridge have I ever entered the Pennsylvania elk draw? I've not. Uh, I've entered the Kentucky one a lot. Uh, ever since Kentucky started allowing non-residents. Um, but not Pennsylvania. Why don't I do an elk hunt in Alberta for whitetail or elk? Uh, because in Alberta, uh, unless you have a, not a resident who will sponsor you for deer, you need an outfitter. Uh, same with elk, you need an outfitter. And we do all self-guided hunts, and so it just doesn't fit for what we do. I have some great friends in Alberta, and I know they would do it, sponsor me for a deer hunt, but how, how relatable would that be to the audience for me to say, oh yeah, my buddy Rich here, uh, you know, we're, we're out hunting, he sponsored me. He's not going to sponsor all you. He can only sponsor one a year anyhow, or one every other year. So that's why we don't do it. We try to do hunts that if you were to draw the tag, your hunt would look a lot like what we're doing. So, um, what do you got, Marcus? Uh, what's your primary source for hunting related statistics and information? What is my primary source for hunting related statistics and information? Two sources. I've, on my bookmarks, I have every game and fish website it's saved in my tabs. But my go-to spot, this accumulation of data, is GoHunt.com. And they have this insider program. And this time of year, you're going to hear me talk about it way more than the rest of the year. Because for us, this is research period. This is, this is when we are researching tags, draw odds, units. So if you go to GoHunt.com and you sign up for their insider and you use our promo code Randy, you're going to get $50 of free credit in an amazing gear shop that they have. But that's my go-to place. And if you were to watch me, I have dual monitors. Over here is GoHunt and over here is Onyx Maps. I, I, I can't live without either of them when I'm doing my research. You just... They're that important to what I do. So those are, as far as data, harvest data, information, uh, draw odds, I'm going to go hunt. Uh, and then I kind of use the state websites 
to give me some of their harvest info or if there's some unique details that I'm trying to figure out sometimes those state websites the fishing game websites will have it so oh let's see Randy I'm looking at buying a loophole VX6 I'm wondering how you deal with the side focus do you have time to mess with it when lining up a shot sometimes you do sometimes you don't if you see the little infinity dial out there Marcus did you just put it on infinity when you were hunting yeah, I think so. yeah so Marcus used it this year and uh, there so you'll see that there's adjustments on there where you can set it where you really don't even have to mess with it uh, so that that's usually what I do if it's a longer shot uh, I know I'm gonna have a lot of time so then I'm not that worried about it but if I know it's gonna be really fast and a lot of times it is uh, I just set it to infinity so all right, what do, <clears throat> what do you got there, Marcus? Uh, somebody's daughter will be old enough to hunt this following year. Do you have any recommendations for a first-time youth hunter? First-time youth hunter. Someone's daughter will be old enough to hunt this year. Uh, boy, the, that depends on where you live. Uh, if you live east and you want to come west, I always tell people the best first western hunt is always antelope. You'll see lots of them. There's lots of public land. They're great eating. Uh, it, it just you can make a mistake and know that you know what I'm probably going to see some more sometime that day. Uh, Wyoming is probably your best option for that. Uh, that's that's where I would go um, if you already live out west. For me, the best uh, first time hunts for a child is usually a deer. Um, I don't. I mean, my first deer, I shot a doe. I was so excited, man. I was, <laughs> I was 14 years old. I shot a doe. I was like, yeah. So whatever it is, just make sure it's fun, both in terms of the conditions, in terms of, you know, don't make it a 12 mile hike that day. Um, try to find some place where he or she is gonna see some cool things, hopefully some wildlife, hopefully some animals that they're looking for, but make it fun. If you make it fun, every time you can build from that and build from that and pretty soon you'll have a hunting partner for life. So, Randy, why is Nevada and Utah at the bottom of your list? There is some great hunting in both those states. There is great hunting in both those states. Both of them require that you buy a non-refundable license. Both of them have very, very sparse opportunity in their quality areas for non-residents. It just, it's a, I, I love Nevada, trust me. I, I apply there every year. I apply in Utah every year. But the person, when we answered that question earlier, is on, I'm assuming is on a budget. And if my budget only goes so far, the first state I'm dropping is Utah, the second state I'm dropping is Nevada. It's, there is great hunting there. But you better be prepared that you're going to be spending a lot of money on non-refundable licenses, on application fees, and you better be patient. I mean, I'm sitting on almost 20 sheep points in Nevada. Uh, I lucked out. I did draw elk there earlier than I should have. Uh, Utah, I'm sitting on the maximum. I, I have the maximum number of non-resident pronghorn points. Uh, I have 20 bison points. It takes a long time to draw in these states. And you add up all of the costs you have in non-resident, non-refundable pur license purchases. When you're dealing with a budget that can only go so far, you got to make some decisions, and those are the two places I, I would make those decisions. Nothing personal, just experience. So, You got anything else there, Marcus? Yeah, so what is the advantage of a new GPS model versus the old gray screen model that this person has? The old gray screen model? Yeah, what would be the oh. advantage? Oh, what would be the advantage of a new GPS versus the old gray screen model? A world of difference. If, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to spend the money for a GPS, right here, Onyx Maps has it. I mean, uh, this smartphone right here is, it's got a GPS built into it. And I've got my app here, and I click on, where is it? My eyes are getting so bad. On X Hunt, right there. And there, you probably can't see that on the screen. But now, even if I want to save battery because I'm in a place with no service, 
If I've downloaded the offline maps and downloaded them to my phone, I can put this on airplane mode and my GPS still works and it pulls up my maps. Don't buy, don't spend the money on a new GPS. Just use your smartphone and subscribe and use the app from, from OnX. It'll be a way better use of your money. Uh, and if you want to save 20% when you do it, use the promo code Randy. So that's, that's what I'd say. Randy, what game bags do you suggest? Uh, I use synthetic game bags from a company called Caribou Game Bags in uh, uh, Colorado. Ted and Sharon, great people, great company. The reason I use synthetic is they're stronger, they're reusable, they allow for evaporation of moisture way, way quicker. There are just a lot of reasons that a, a synthetic bag is going to last you your lifetime if you take care of it. It doesn't stretch. So those mesh bags that stretch, right? You put a boned out out quarter in one of those cheesecloth style ones and all of a sudden the mesh in there is, is, you know, that big because of the weight pulling on the mesh. Guess what? A fly lands on there, lays some eggs in your meat and now you got maggots. Sorry, I, uh, I'm willing to pay the little bit of extra money for synthetic bags that are gonna last me forever. So caribou game bags is, uh, is what I use. And since we're getting on equipment, I guess I'll answer this one too. What brand of elk calls do I use? I use the elk calls from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Uh, Rocky Jacobson, he's the kind of the, the brainchild of that. Uh, his son, Corey, you've seen Corey and I hunt together uh, multiple times. They've won, I don't know how many world elk calling championships. If you're going to buy a bugle, diaphragm call, stuff like that, I would go to and I would go and find where you can get Rocky Mountain hunting calls. They're, they they make a wide array of them, and you can go to their their little factory in Kamii. Is that how you pronounce that, Marcus? We went there in April, and you can see them there just stamping them out, testing them, making sure every one of them is meets their specs. This isn't just kind of oh looks good enough. They are serious about building the best elk calls. That's why I use them. I can't find a better elk call. So Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the place I'd go. Back to the game bags. Do you reuse game bags? They seem to look new. <clears throat> oh, someone's asking, do I reuse the game bags because they always look new in the show? So <laughs> here's what we do with the game bags. I give them to camera guys. I give them to guest hunters or whatever because Ted and Sharon send me boxes of them and say, give some away as promo items and always use new ones. We want them to show up and have our logo and we want them to look nice. So I, I know some of you are like, what do you mean reusable game bags? Newberg's using new ones every trip. That, that's why, you, <laughs> that's a good catch. Whoever caught that, that was a good catch. Uh, but I got a lot of friends who have really, really good game bags because uh, the generosity of the folks at Caribou Game Bags. <laughs> uh, what reticles do I prefer on my Leupold rifle scopes for deer, elk, and antelope? For every one of them, I have a heavy duplex, either duplex or heavy duplex. That's the reticle I use. Oh, what do you got there, Marcus? Arizona has quote unquote tag insurance, right? Uh, what do they call it? Uh, they just came out with it last year. It's called tag something. It, it's like tag insurance. What it means is if you apply and something comes up, you have a health issue, an employment issue, you can turn that tag back in and get all your points back. I think when you apply, you got to do it through their portal. And I think it's a $5 fee for this. Gosh, it's slipping my mind. Tag. Uh, oh, well. Anyhow, uh, it's Arizona has that feature that you, Point guard, there you go. Marcus came up with it, point guard. So, uh, <clears throat> Randy, what are the drawbacks of applying as a group in Colorado and sh what should be my strategy? So some states average your points. So let's talk about this. You have three people applying. One person has two points, one person has five points, and one person has six points. 
Well, your average of those three, 13 divided by three, well, that's, you're just over a four point average. Some states round down, most states round down, but some states like Colorado, and this question is specific to Colorado, they don't average your points in a party app. They say, what does the lowest point holder have? Well, that's what everybody gets. So if you're doing a party application in a state like Colorado, make sure everybody has the same number of points. If you're doing it in some of the states where they average, well, it doesn't matter. They're going to average what your, the, each applicant has. They're going to take the total points, divide by the number of applicants, and say, that's what you go in for. And some states round down, some states round up. So read the regulations for each of them. But uh, party app strategies in Colorado, not a good idea unless you're all at the same point total. Do I plan on spring bear hunting in southwest Montana again this year? What's the old saying? Does a bear poop in the woods? We're going spring bear hunting here in Montana again this year. We go every year. Let's see. <clears throat> How many miles did you put on your pickup in hunting season? <laughs> How many miles do I put on my pickup in a hunting season? Usually between 20 and 25,000. And most of those are from August 1st to December 10th. I, uh, I just got off the road and there's a lot of miles. There's a reason that I have XM Radio, Willie's Roadhouse, uh, NFL Network because I get a lot of windshield time. Right. So, <clears throat> Randy, do you use anything special to kill the scent in your boots other than scent killer? No, I don't even use scent killer. I just change my socks. I, I You guys have heard me say this many times on this uh this uh, elk talk live i don't believe in any of those scent products zero none for elk hunting you're wasting your money save that money and go buy something else so uh do i have advice for youtube hunters uh i'm not sure what you mean by that question but uh if you want to start a youtube channel uh, make it something that you do as best you can as far as professionalism Make sure and understand that you are presenting an image of hunting. Try to make it as respectable, as clean, as good, as uh, as responsible as possible. So, and if that is what you want to do, you got to do it every day. It's a job. We we do YouTube content. We're stacking it up. We try to get something out every day. We don't always succeed, but if you don't do it every day, it's uh, it's tough. Oh, do we want to answer that last question, Matthew? Go for it. Tell us the story of your start with filming your hunts and what inspired you to take that route. Matthew talked me into it. I was sick. They told me I had to scale back at the CPA world. Matthew was doing a lot of computer work and video editing and filming, and he said, ah, we could do as good as those guys. Well... Here we are. When was that, 2005, Matthew? Uh, 12 to, yeah, well, when, when you talked me into buying the cameras, that was 2005, I think. <clears throat> so, what height of scope ring do I use? Uh, I usually use medium height, and what they're talking about, say, so when you mount your scope on your rifle, you got your base, and then you got your rings, and the scope goes in the ring. <clears throat> well, those rings sit at a certain height, I always use mediums if I can. Sometimes I've had to use high. Uh, I never use extra high and I never use low. So, oh gosh, we are cranking through them. What else we got there, Marcus? Um, so this one is gonna be kind of complicated depending on the state, but <laughs> what differs in your selection between a first choice unit and subsequent choices? What differs between my first choice applications when I'm applying for elk and my second, third, or whatever? Well, it depends on the state because some states only look at your first choice before they go on to the next person. And then some states, like Nevada, look at all five of your choices before they go on to the next person. So the, the answer to that is it, it depends on the state. My first choice in a state that only looks at your first choice I don't even do second and third choices usually in those states. 
my first choice is usually a mix of what's got the greatest likelihood of me drawing with some decent amount of public land and I don't care what it takes. I'm good at navigating that public and private land interface. I'll figure out a way. So I'm usually very, very seldom am I swinging for the fences wanting one of those glory tags. I just want to go hunt. Now states that, let's say Nevada or Arizona looks at your first two, New Mexico your first three, Nevada your first five. I start with something really tough as my first choice and then as I get towards the bottom, I start putting in choices that I know have better draw odds. That's, that's really my strategy for it. So um i i can't say it works but it's uh it's what i do but holy cow how can we need to continue this discussion i feel like we just barely even scratched the surface of how to go elk hunting every year and we've already been at it for 45 minutes and the battery there is flashing which means it's probably going to croak so before that croaks i better remind everybody that if you will share this with your friends, it's great for us. It helps us. It helps all of our partners. And you and they will get notified if you text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 77453. And you can hunt elk every year. I hope this helped with that. We might even continue this discussion next week. More ideas about how to hunt elk every year. Uh, but also, I just I can't express how thankful I am to these companies that they're the ones who are they bought all this hardware they said Randy you just show up we'll pay the cost and uh, that's why we can bring you Elk Talk Live is because of Bowtech and Leupold and Onyx Maps and Go Hunt and Ripcord, Tight Spot, Black Gold, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation all of them make this possible I hope you're getting some value out of it some benefit um, and if you are so inclined, I hope you'll go and watch us on our YouTube channel, Randy Newberg Hunter. I hope you'll listen to our podcast. You can get it on iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, the, that's called Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, and we have an Amazon channel. If you subscribe to Amazon Prime, that starting this year, that's where we're going to start putting our new episodes. Our first going to go to Amazon. So if you have Amazon Prime, it's free to you to watch that. No longer do you got to subscribe to a TV package. And then after they've been on Amazon, eventually they'll get to YouTube. So is that it guys? I think we got it. Happy New Year, everybody. Hope you have a great year. I hope your mailbox is stuffed full of elk tags in 2018. Thanks for watching. Holy moly. That one.